Um, thank you very much, everyone, for coming this morning. Thank you, Jenny, for the opportunity uh, to talk with folks and engage in this discussion. It's really exciting to be able to do this. Uh, I understand it's the first Executive Dean's Coffee after the long years of the pandemic, so um, uh, really delightful. Uh, unfortunately, this talk does not end on a super upbeat note because it's about the fragility of American democracy. And I might go on just a little bit more than 20 minutes, but if people kind of get tired of the remarks, feel free to raise your hand and, and say, uh, stop, we want to start talking ourselves. <laughs> okay, so the remarks follow, I guess, I think probably three different um, parts. One is to say a little bit more to make the fragility of American democracy a little bit more vivid for people. The second is to inquire about some of what I regard as the longer term trends about how we got here and then I'll end with a few remarks about what the Kennedy School is doing about fragile democracy, different parts of the Kennedy School. We're doing many things. I won't be comprehensive, but just to offer a little bit. And these remarks do focus on American democracy. Our work, of course, extends all over the world and in many, many different contexts. Um, so I want to roll the tape forward a couple of years. What do you regard as the worst case scenario of the 2024 election for uh, many of our students and many people at the Kennedy School who tend a little bit more to the left side of the spectrum, it might be a Donald Trump Electoral College victory. I would regard that as, um, you know, maybe not completely aligned with my political preferences, but completely unproblematic from the point of view of small d democracy. That's how it's supposed to work. You have a presidential election, uh, whoever wins the Electoral College victory wins and gets four years of an administration. So I don't think that's a worst case scenario or even necessarily a very bad scenario for American democracy at all. Um, I think that a far worse and somewhat plausible scenario that um, I uh, slate very much helped develop a little caselet that I'll be teaching in the MPP core on Monday, um, I'll run a version of this by you, is that uh, Joe Biden and his uh, uh, running mate, maybe Kamala Harris, maybe somebody else, get a popular vote victory and an electoral college victory, but Donald Trump becomes president legally. Now, how would that be? <laughs> you have to make, uh, there's a little bit of a story here. Uh, it would have to be that Republicans control both, there's different versions of this. Here's one version, both houses of Congress in 2024. 2024 popular vote is very close in some swing states and that state laws shift election implementation power to legislatures or partisan election boards in, uh, by 2024, as they've done a little bit. And then some state legislatures decide, maybe it's only one or two, to uh, disregard the popular vote, maybe because they suspect that there's widespread electoral fraud, and se instead send a slate of electors for Donald Trump to the Electoral College. And then uh, the Congress certifies these electoral college votes. Donald Trump is then, at that moment, legal precedent, president. But then, of course, the Democrats would sue all over the place, of course. And then maybe it goes up to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court, relying on other precedents, like Bush v. Gore 2000, decides to uh, throw the electoral college and therefore the presidency to Donald Trump. At that point, he would be legally president. And then I would like to ask you, what would you do in that circumstance? Would you engage in uh, what Al Gore did under not quite the same, but parallel circumstances is concede the presidency to George W. Bush in 2000. He said the Supreme Court ruled, I think I won, but they don't think so. It's over. I'm out. Would you do that? And if you did that, how much can you say you really care about democracy? Or would you go to the streets and protest and say, hey, democracy is being robbed? And if you did that, how different would you be from those who participated in the January 6th insurrection on the Capitol? So I think this situation creates a very hard fork. And that's what it means to live in a fragile democracy is that the institutions and the compass points that we used to rely on to tell us what counts as a democratic outcome we cannot rely upon anymore. Institutional certainty, the judiciary, the popular vote, 
these things should go in the same direction. I've just offered a case in which they do not, right? Okay. I do think that um, 2020 offers a little bit of a prologue to this scenario. Um, the January 6th insurrection is what many people think. But before that, there uh, and after that, there are many, many consequences that immediately lead up and precede. Uh, one consequence afterwards is that a majority of Republicans still believe, a large majority of Republicans still believe that the 2020 election was not legitimately won by Joe Biden. In the 2022 midterm exit polls from CNN, about three to four out of every 10 voters in the midterm elections do not believe that Joe Biden legitimately won the 2020 election. That is a large number of the electorate. Um, okay, and so that's at the popular level. At the elite level, 147 members of Congress, remember in 2021, objected to the election counts, uh, including 120 plus members of Congress um, uh, objected to the electoral counts in Arizona and Pennsylvania. There was actually a lot of thought about how um, the electoral count might be reversed in 2020. Uh, as we learned, even before the, the, January, the hearings on January 6th, uh, uh, a lawyer who was counsel, sort of, to Donald Trump, John Eastman, uh, wrote a memo and plans about this. He said, okay, when Congress, when the House is about to vote to certify the elections, here's what we should do. When he, that is the, uh, uh, the vote gets to Arizona, he announces that he has multiple slates of electors, and so he's going to defer the decision. This is Vice President uh, Pence as he's kind of going through in Congress in the certification. At the end, he, Pence, announces that because of ongoing disputes in seven states, there are no electors that can be deemed validly appointed in those states, right? This is a piece of advice to Donald Trump or uh, to uh, Vice President Pence. And then Eastman says, Pence, uh, what would happen next is pursuant to the 12th Amendment, no candidate has achieved a necessary majority. That sends the matter back to the House. That is the matter of who should be president of the United States. Back to the House. The Republicans have a majority of the House, currently control 26 of the state delegations. And it's this one vote per state, according to uh, this procedure, that gives Trump a bare majority necessary to win that vote. And in that circumstance, President Trump is reelected. This is a memo um, preceding January 6th and late 2020 to um, Vice President Pence. He asked his, uh, he, Vice President Pence, was confused by this memo. He asked his good friend Dan Quayle what he should do, and Dan Quayle said, I really don't think you should do that. So um, I think probably it's Fox News with the early Arizona call and Vice President Pence disregarding this advice that saved American democracy in 2020. Okay, part one, and this is part two. How did we get here? Uh, I want to submit to you that democracy is far from a normal condition is actually a miracle. And it's a miracle because it requires two things. One, all of the societies that we live in are plural in the sense that we have deep, deep disagreements about who God is, about whether women have a right to choose, about whether guns should be freely available or highly restricted, about whether climate change demands action right now or in the fullness of time, enough technological innovation will get us there and solve the problem. So chill out. These are, this, these are some dimensions of plural society that characterize every society and certainly every democratic society. That's what pluralism means. And democracy requires in the circumstances of pluralism, losers accept losing. And that's really hard. And what that means is that for a democracy to be successful, enough people in that democracy have to say the process, the quality of the process is more important to me than winning and getting my way. And so uh, there will always be in every, any society some number of people who think, no, my way or the highway. If I don't win, then uh, I do what I can to uh, upset the apple cart, but a successful democracy requires that many more people care about the process rather than the substance. 
And one fundamental reason why our democracy is so fragile right now is that more and more Americans really feel like winning is existential. And this is true among many, many sides of the spectrum. And when you feel that winning is existential, you think substance is more important than the process. Here's an audience exercise. You, like me, like all of us, care about many, many substantive issues. Perhaps that's woman's right to choose, climate change, income inequality, mass incarceration, uh, and uh, over-policing, not over-pricing, sorry. Freedom to bear arms, religious freedom, right? Um, pick some number of issues that you really, really care about, like the top three, right? And then for which of those issues, if you lost out in the democratic process, you would say, oh, the other side got more votes. I just need to do better next time, try to convince more people. They get to have their way, right? That's number two. That's the bitter pill that democracy requires. Not simply because you don't have uh, enough force to get your way, but you really, really believe that they should get their way because they got more votes. Now, it has to be an issue in which you think it's right that democracy car carries the day, not just because you have to. Now, if, there, if the number of issues on that list for you is zero or one or two, I submit to you, you're not a Democrat at all. You're not a Democrat at all. You're just a justice authoritarian. And the issue these days, one reason why democracy is so fragile is that more and more of us are justice authoritarians and fewer, fewer of us are small D Democrats. And, you know, you could be, of course, a justice authoritarian on the right or a justice authoritarian on the left. But that's why democracy is a miracle. OK, it's a miracle that is more miraculous these days because of um, a couple of, of features of our democracy that I'll point out now. The first is what I call wide aperture politics. And I think roughly since Brexit or maybe a few years before that with social media, the range of our political views has become much wider than it was. Um, for Janny and me, and maybe for some of you, most of your political memory, I think, is a very narrow aperture politics. And uh, my provocative way of putting this is that for most of my political memory, the difference between the Democrats and the Republicans was the difference between French vanilla and vanilla ice cream. And when political scientists like try to figure out why most why a lot of people don't vote, one of the things that they discovered was that many people just honestly couldn't tell the difference, right? This is true, I shit you not, right? Um, and so in that period of narrow aperture politics, the center left and the center right agree on many, many things, on the desirability of globalization and free trade, on liberal democracy, on welfare reform and a fairly constrained welfare state, on uh, relatively unconstrained markets, on a certain view of racial meritocratic inclusion. Uh, Margaret Thatcher summed up this view in uh, her phrase, Tina, there is no alternative. Um, one of my favorite uh, uh, stories uh, about Margaret Thatcher is that in uh, 2022, at a dinner party in Hampshire, UK, a uh, dinner guest is seated next to Lady Thatcher and asks her, uh, what is your greatest achievement as one of, certainly one of the greatest prime ministers of, of uh, the United Kingdom, of England? And she says, later Thatcher says, Tony Blair and New Labour are my greatest achievement. And why is that? It's because we forced our opponents to change. They're basically like us now, right? What greater political achievement is there than that? Right? And that's the sense in which this long period from 1980 to, two, you know, whatever, you can, you can draw the fuzz with the date boundaries, but it's a very narrow aperture politics. Um, but from 2015-16 on, it is not a narrow aperture politics. It's really, really wide. You have MAGA and Brexit on one hand, social movements versus a strong executive proposals for the universal basic income, um, all, uh, proposals to build a wall that's uh, like the Great Wall of China that's separating the United States and Mexico, right? People really, really have very, very, very different policy position, positions. Um, I don't know how many people were, their political memory uh, stems back this far, but 
say you rolled into the second term Obama administration and said, hey, I think we should really talk about the universal basic income or national uh, single payer health care, right? People first would have thought it was a joke. And then when you kept pushing a little bit, they thought would think you're kind of nuts. And then you would have been politely escorted out of the West Wing and your, uh, your uh, West Wing Oval Office pass be taken away, right? Uh, because that was a very, very narrow aperture time. And those ideas were considered bonkers. But now they're very, very much a part of the debate. And so this is even, you know, I'm trying to stress the point, second term Obama administration, right? You think, well, uh, but it was very different, at least in my estimation. So the problem here is that um, as you go from the narrow aperture world of a Bill Clinton to a Bush uh, to a wide aperture world of an AOC and a Ted Cruz, the number of people thinking substance is really, really important dramatically increases. This goes along with increasing polarization. In 1973, 80 to 90% of Congress was between the rightmost Democrat and the leftmost Republican. Today, uh, and uh, since uh, 2017, that number is zero. There is nobody between the leftmost Republican and the rightmost Democrat. At the cultural level, uh, 20, this is old. I'm sure the numbers are far higher now. 26% of uh, Democrats, 36% of Republicans see the other side as a fundamental threat to the nation's well-being. Um, and then uh, culturally, about 7 in 10 Democratic people who are open to dating would not date someone who is a Republican. And uh, the, I think Republicans are a little bit more open-minded, but uh, not so much. <clears throat> Declining institutional trust. Uh, as we know, uh, the number of people who trust government when John F. Kennedy, the namesake of this institution, was president, about three in four Americans said they trusted people in Washington to do what's right all of the time or most of the time. That number on a good day now is in the 20s. So uh, public trust is very, very low. The number of people who have a negative view of both parties. This is not a partisanship measure. This is an anti-system measure of sentiment is at, um, is at all time highs. In 2022, a third of America or a quarter to a third of Americans hate both parties, a pulse on both your houses. Back in 94, it was a very low percentage, it was 6%. Um, I think this has to do with a fifth factor, which is unresponsive government. A, uh, you know, democracy is many things, but one of the intuitions is that what democracy requires is that the people making the laws should be responsive somewhat to what people think. Uh, and so this is a kind of figure uh, that defines responsive government. Um, the green line is a responsive government. If a larger percentage of citizens want something to happen, the greater the percentage chance that the that government will do that thing. That's the green line, right? An unresponsive government is one in which it doesn't matter if 90% of citizens want something or 5% of citizens want something to happen, what government does is a coin toss, right? That's the red line, is unresponsive government. Um, a great, great uh, line of work by uh, Marty Gillins, who is now at UCLA, used to be at Princeton University, looked at dec a few decades of polling compared to a few decades of congressional legislation and he looked at the subset of measures for which people who are relatively better off have different views, policy views, from people who are less well off. And here's what he found. He found the red line. Government is just flat out unresponsive. It doesn't matter whether 90% of people favor a policy change or 10%. It's a coin toss for uh, what Congress does. It's a remarkable finding. However, there is a little bit of good news. If you just take the top 10% of the income distribution and ask what they want, government is highly responsive to what they want. Um, okay, and I think that that kind of goes along with um, a fact pattern that's very well known, is that in uh, roughly since the mid-1970s, um, U.S. growth has been very unevenly distributed to the top uh, ends of the income distribution. So the top 0.1% uh, since 1980, their uh, annual earnings have increased by 350%. 
the bottom for the bottom 90%, it's increased by 22%. So what should we do? Uh, and this is the last part of the slide. I need a better bobblehead. But if you think of uh, democracy as a patient, this is my biological metaphor. There are three things happening to the patient right now. There's a heart attack, there are chronic challenges, and there are systemic challenges. The heart attack is January 6th, and the 2024-25 scenario that I sketched, that would be a heart attack. Patient has a heart attack, probably dies, nothing else to talk about. But even if you stem the heart attack, the patient still faces chronic challenges. High blood sugar, doesn't exercise much, doesn't eat much, has high blood pressure. Um, and then the patient also, even if you take care of those things, has systemic challenges, the, the biological metaphor, which I may be pushing a little bit too much. The patient lives in a food desert with pollution levels as high as Beijing or Delhi on a bad day. And so what to do about American democracy requires action at all three levels. Um, so here are some of the things that uh, people around the Kennedy School are doing at the heart attack level. There's some people thinking about how to protect officials from election violence and intimidation. Erica Chenoweth and her colleagues are trying to understand anti-authoritarian and pro-democracy movements. Danielle Allen and others are educating students about democratic fragility and trying to up the civic, edu uh, civic and democratic education not only around the university, but in K through 12 schools all around the country. Um, we are in the MPP program have incorporated fragile democracy as a much more prominent theme than it has been in uh, past years. At the chronic level, some of the chronic problems are a low voter suppression, gerrymandering, uh, low voter participation, corruption and conflict of interest. Um, one thing that uh, we do university-wide is the Harvard Votes Challenge to try to get faculty, staff, students all to register more and encourage electoral participation. Uh, the Kennedy School can claim credit for a number of democracy startups like VoteR and TurboVote. Uh, we have folks working on the corporate responsibility to be a uh, foster democratic participation. Starbucks, which is not so good on some things, has been uh, quite good on electoral participation later, the Gap, uh, Patagonia, others, and you know, like looking at what the corporate responsibility is for a healthy democracy. Um, and then uh, we do try to amplify and foster innovations like citizen redistricting. Um, uh, more than a decade ago now, the Ash Center gave a prize to, among others, Arnold Schwarzenegger as a champion of creating the California Citizens Redistricting Commission, which uh, now the districting lines in California are drawn by ordinary citizens, and anyone can apply to be on that body. And as a result of shifting uh, map drawing out of the legislature to the Citizens Redistricting Commission, the, um, the maps are much, much better. Michigan recently adopted that model um, through a referendum process. And the first time that it kicked in that the new maps were used was this midterm election with dramatic effects on the constitution of the Mich Michigan legislature. And then finally, systemic challenges like spatial and political polarization, unresponsive government, dysfunctional media environment. I would put in there the two-party system and our minority rule institutions and other antiquated institutions. Our constitution now is about 250 years old. You wouldn't drive a 250 year old car. It needs a little bit of a tune up, right? The last substantial modification to our constitution was more than 50 years ago, which it lowered the voting rate age to 18. That was before electric cars, the internet, mobile phones, right? Our constitution is notoriously difficult to amend and change. Um, we have a reimagining democracy initiative at the Ash Center. We recently did a Beyond Winner Take All symposium that was um, very successful, that looked at uh, options for the United States to move beyond a two-party system. Uh, people at the law school are participating very actively in court reform discussions. The United States is the only country in the world with lifetime appointments to its constitutional court. It's really quite an outlier. 
Um, and then we uh, are would like to think about and get a little bit deeper on looking at states as laboratories of democratic innovation. So those are just a few of the things that are happening around the Kennedy School to deal with these many challenges to democracy at the heart attack level, at the chronic level, and at the systemic level. And I describe it this way because it's very easy to focus, as I did at the outset, on the heart attack level, because that's the thing that jumps up that's really kind of significant and grabs your attention and feels so urgent. And we do need people working on the heart attack. But even if we took care, we, first of all, the heart attack didn't come out of nowhere, right? And so the middle part of my remarks was about where it came from. And then um, even if we do take care of the heart attack, American democracy would still have more heart attacks and would still be very fragile unless we address challenges at the chronic and systemic levels. Thank you very much.